Uh, I'll try to keep my comments a little bit thinner today because we've already taken a lot of time here for that priority setting. Um, thank you for all your input into it. So yesterday, we started uh, with a discussion of multiple dynamic modeling. Okay, um, and uh, these dynamic modeling types were all, as the name suggests, dynamic models. And uh, as dynamic models, they were characterized by their evolution, their change over time, depending on the current state of the model. They, they had state, they had a current situation in the model. And up here on this very board, I drew a box and I said that often people in the modeling who, who engage with modeling but have no previous exposure to it have a simple mental model, maybe based on spreadsheets where you have input output. And they think that, oh, well, these models are just fancy input output. You put an input, it cranks, and they. You know, it's a crystal ball and it tells you what will be or something, something like that. Um, and uh, and what I said is, you know, the models we're dealing with have, have this internal state and they have structure here and they have internal state which evolves over time. And this is true of any of these types of models. The three types of modeling we discussed here, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, and system dynamics modeling, they all share more in common than they differ from each other. Now they differ in big ways. But they, what they conserve in common is just vastly more than they than those those differences. They're all dynamical modeling, um, dynamical modeling tools. They all characterize dynamical systems, so they have a state, and they all characterize how the change over the next little bit of time depends on the current state. And some of Oh, um, okay, I saw tech staff go by um, about 30 seconds ago um, in silhouette. Um, I think I recognize the silhouette. So if someone, uh, yeah, if you could go get them from their, their layer, that would be great, thanks. Sorry, oh. Um, no, I don't want to share the screen. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so these models all characterize change over the next little bit of time based on the current situation. Now, the language they use to characterize that change, which will be obtaining over the next little bit of time, it differs from technique to technique. And now I will begin. Thank you, Carrie. How did you frob it? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad people don't have that problem. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> You're not going to tell me, like, stick a white up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel the button. Okay, the far right. Okay. 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 Great. Great. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much, Carrie. So you want me to push the buttons of the far right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, I did that during my comment. Um, so, um, okay. So these different methods have different ways of characterizing change over the next little bit based on the current state of the model. So we had for example, uh, discrete event simulation, which characterized the current situation of the model in terms of how many people are waiting for different queues or, or you know, undergoing certain types of of, of, um, uh, of activities like in a in a procedure or, or what have you, and uh, it characterized you know uh, how soon those people would emerge or how many of them would balk um, or the probability that they would balk over the next little bit waiting and, and leave without being seen. Um, and uh, 
that was one way of characterizing change uh, over the next little bit based on the current situation. So if I were to kind of drag this in here um, and go down toward the end of this presentation, we could have we could have seen um, the street about the same. So um, here we are. So it was this sort of situation. And we had this way of characterizing the current state and characterizing the change in the current state over the next little bit. Um, so it was associated with resource progress of entities through resource constrained workflow. Um, and this was an exquisite tool for the purposes of assessing how waiting times and throughput, the number of people, say, to be treated per day, um, how, how long they have to be kept waiting, the length of those lists, um, how, how quickly they emerge from the process, um, et cetera. How did those things depend on availability of certain resources or placement of certain resources? That's what this type of modeling excelled at. It was just one feature of these systems that say, how does change depend on the current state? Change over the next little bit depend on the current state. In system dynamics modeling, we had another way of saying, how does change over the next little bit of time depend on the current state? Change over the next little bit of time was characterized with flows and they depended on the current state. So the number of people being infected depended on the number of susceptibles and the number of and so the change, the rate of change is characterized by the flows or net flow into and out of the stock um, depended on current state. And it says, as a result, how, does, how do things change over the next little bit based on the state? In agent-based modeling, by contrast, we had a same sort of situation. Maybe for this, I will just put up a, um, you know, a, a control uh, model here. Um, this was neighborhood mortality, but I'd like to open a model that was a little bit more um, more textured than that. Um, so maybe I'll open up that social tobacco use model that we built, right? Um, here we go. And here we had the state of the system encoded. At any one time, someone would be in a certain state simple state of this left state chart and a certain simple state of this right state chart. And, and the change over the next little bit will be dictated by these actions, transitions out, and the rules that govern them in the form of these, these characterizations of the logic associated with that. For example, the um, fact that this is a hazard rate, a chance per unit time of lead damage. And so is this, and we had timeouts, et cetera, as this point, et cetera. So once again, it's just another way of saying, how does the change of the system um, depend on the current state of the system? So three different ways. They all are close cousins, but they're close cousins that specialize in certain areas that are, that are um, really well adapted to certain types of characterization. System dynamics for characterizing the dynamics of continuous systems marked by feedback and accumulation. Agent-based modeling, um, beautifully um, flexible fashion, uh, can characterize systems marked by one or more populations of individuals interacting with each other and with the environment evolving in rich ways and often characterized by by nested contexts as well sometimes by and, and by contexts such as spatial location and such as uh, network uh, context and eventually nested nested context um, uh, these these are tools that are well adapted to describe certain types of situations um, if you are characterizing dynamics of reservoir, um, uh, I was part of a modeling team that helped recommend uh, the use of water recycling in, in one prominent country worldwide um, about 20 to 25 years ago. Um, 
since adopted and, and water recycling turned into a real boon for that for that country and it's uh, geopolitical um, reducing geopolitical vulnerabilities and now it's being considered in the US for that I used system dynamics modeling because it was the natural tool to capture reservoir flows and pooling you know availability of water in different areas we could have combined it with agent-based modeling for um, consumption of water and, and judgments of whether to conserve or whether to use, et cetera. But you know, for characterizing flows of continuous quantities and system dynamics is wonderful. Um, uh, and other tools will use discrete events. So yesterday we saw though, that we're not dealing with purely just a choice between these methods. It is often good to have couple models in a given area to sharpen your thinking. But often these days, the best choice is to combine them, if you can. Combine them even in a single model. Um, to do so requires a little bit of care, but it can really pay off in terms of flexibility, ability to change the boundaries between them as your learning evolves, ability to communicate with different types of stakeholders with modeling components familiar to them, uh, ability to make use of data of certain sorts, ability to address research questions or, or what if questions driven by system stakeholders, et cetera. So we saw how to weave these together. These are close cousins, these types of models. Um, and, uh, you know, I would urge new generations of system scientists, those aspiring to careers which use these methods to keep their, their their uh, skills broader rather than specializing purely in one. Um, but yesterday afternoon, we went on to explore particular features of, of agent-based models that are one component that makes them really flexible. We incorporated an additional element of context. I spoke about how Poston and Tilly yesterday morning in my reflection spoke about context mechanism outcome in their book on uh, realist evaluation and more generally in critical realist philosophy. Um, and um, agent-based modeling, of all those types of models, those three types of modeling, I think it's the most flexible in terms of capturing context. You know, we think about many other great advantages of it heterogeneity first and foremost among them, but the ability to capture context of rich sort, spatial context, geographic context, network context are exceedingly powerful and important. And in today's world with health problems where context is so important, where concerns about social determinants of health drive so many research questions, where we're concerned about the emergence of health equity concerns. We're concerned about the impacts of adverse environments on people, um, uh, about social influences, uh, uh, pro-social or problematic, such as on spread of, of conspiracy theories. Capturing context is really, really important. And spatial context uh, offers uh, you know, a great deal of, of uh, of prominence within that discussion. So we saw yesterday two types of spatial context. One was more stylized, where people were moving back and forth between homes and workplaces and schools. And um, uh, as such, um, they, uh, they were exposed to different environments. And although we didn't elaborate it, we could have elaborated that with a, a depiction of the spread of social norms. Oh, we zoomed out. Here are the workplaces are much smaller. I left it in that adverse state. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll go uh, and just change that back. Um, so uh, Wade will have to remind me. I think I changed this from um, to 100 meters from 10 meters. It's to sort of show the effects of speed. It's my recollection. I'm in Maine there. Um, oh, this is something I've got to be really careful. Which Maine is open? This, 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 so this is uh, 400. Okay. Okay. I may have done something bad. Um, I, I think I just changed the social tobacco use there. Okay. So be careful, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'll change this to 10 meters, fine. And I'll change this to, to 10 meters to be consistent with that as well. So, and in this context, we saw people moving back and forth to different workplaces and homes and schools in ways that were more stylized. They, they, weren't, ge they weren't geographically rooted, um, but they were still useful. And often in a model, we end up um, having a stylized depiction. So maybe like in some of our modeling, you have a more uh, a depiction, say, of a central region that's an urban region, and then a hinterland around it, which is as low, has lower population. And it kind of it doesn't reflect a particular city, uh, rather it's sort of uh, you know, mixed environment where you have some urban environment, and some some uh, uh, some rural or or suburban environment. Um, but this was an abstract model, and we could capture movement between contexts. And it will be straightforward to layer on this spread of influence or or exposure to these environments. And I'm glad to do that if if there's strong interest. Um, uh, but then. In the um, later in the afternoon, we took a look at a model which involved GIS data, and I argued that GIS data was really powerful for capturing certain types of effects and influence, etc. Um, so uh, we could capture effects of an actual geographic environment in terms of walkability, in terms of food availability, uh, in terms of crime, uh, in terms of resources like billboards advertising for tobacco um, in the US or, or you know, tobacco promotion and tobacco retail outlets in the US. We could, we could situate that in a GIS environment and we could, by so doing, capture influences on individuals, you know, presence of um, very small particular matter in a way that could be um, inhaled and maybe uh, expose people to endocrine disruption or whatnot. So um, uh, geographic environments uh, are really useful often to represent. And it's not a one-way street. Often people modify um, elements of that geography, but we can use it to to also influence people's decision making. And this goes to Michael's comment before on people's choices and their learning and their evolution of their thinking. That could be represented here, and at the least, choices might reflect, you know, the distance from one point to another, for example whether they want to go in LA from Westwood to, you know, to uh, Redondo Beach or something would depend on, on the, the, the physical distance and the time of day. And they might make use of more local resources other, uh, otherwise. So, so here, the environments are often um, ones that affect choices that people make. Um, and uh, sometimes it affects health evolution. Um, and by virtue of this, we can bring together other health information with GIS shaped files. We didn't take that to its logical conclusion, but those of you um, who, if any, are from the start will remember that on the very first day, we actually tried out um, as our sort of first, first model that we examined. This would have been um, uh, a model where we had GIS and food and physical activity environment. And this environment was geographic, it was based in Melbourne, Australia, and people's choices were based on their distance from a park or their distance from convenience stores and grocery stores. Um, so that's where that was, um, uh, that's where, you know that was a model making use of of this sort of uh, this sort of information. Um, right. So um, having this in your model allows you to bring in a lot more types of information. 
terrain types, um, other, other resources in a geographic setting, um, uh, pollutant levels, what have you. So that was yesterday, um, a reflection on broader techniques within the system science toolbox, and then zeroing in on this spatial context feature of, of agent-based models. Um, a lot going on, uh, a lot going on uh, yesterday. And uh, today we're gonna build on this discussion. Um, this morning is going to largely be about the interaction between these models and data. Uh, I was reviewing uh, in my day job yesterday, um, before the opening of the boot camp, a set of scholarship applications. And one of them involved someone proposing to use an agent based model, and they were passing it off as an AI. And I said, this, this ain't no AI technique. Uh, um, it is a technique that can use big data. It is a technique that can leverage big data, but it's not, it's not a technique involving artificial intelligence in a traditional sense. Um, it is a computational modeling technique that pairs that with AI. Um, but, but their application did reflect that agent-based models have a close relationship with, uh, with data. And I would say in some ways a closer, more tighter relationship than some other types of, of models, um, uh, of, of uh, dynamic modeling. Um, and we're gonna talk about that nexus of agent-based modeling and data this morning. We're gonna talk about it in the form of calibration, in the form of sensitivity analysis and stochastics, and in terms of some broader opportunities for, for bringing together data and, and models of this sort, such as uh, parameterization with big data, et cetera. Um, and uh, then this afternoon, we're going to expand our skill sets with these models for a lot of other essentials that need to be filled in for you to go home with a kind of a full toolbox of, of, um, of, of know-how um, on, on these sorts of models. Um, and of course, we'll have Kurt Kruger's presentation, and I'm gonna try to see by hook or crook how we could have a Java class. And I'm considering doing it at six o'clock or I'm considering layering it in uh, late in the afternoon, and I'm, I'm just gonna have to figure out the timing. Uh, other cover and your feedback on the topic earlier today is going to help me reprioritize. Okay, so that's anyway what's planned for today. A little bit on tomorrow. Any discussions or uh, or you know otherwise questions or comments or um, uh, or queries people would like to put forward before we begin uh, for the day. I'm just trying to open up. Window here so I could see online online discussion. Any anything that someone would want to put forward here, um, just to talk about. Walkability. Walkability, right? Yeah, sure. So, uh, for for our online guests, there was a question on how would I go about incorporating walkability into a model? Right. Um. So, uh, let's let's take uh, take this model here. And uh, Wade, you you probably been um, contemplating why this wasn't loading the uh, the appropriate tile files. So I'm thinking it's probably because it. Maybe it's using OpenStreetMap Classic. Okay, thanks. Um, there we go. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so um, we have a set of choices for for the the map or imagery used here, and um, I just changed that. But this model is a useful substrate for this discussion. So I wanted to have 
So um, it's ironic we're having this with Melbourne because Melbourne is one of the most walkable cities in the world. Um, and uh, uh, I, I created this model during one of our several boot camps in Melbourne, and um, there was a lot of interest in this. Um, uh, so, uh, neighborhoods are sometimes graded with walkability indices, um, which indicate you know, their, their relative level of, of um, support for, um, for, for pedestrian um, movement, right? And uh, there may be other factors that also bear on the viability of movement, including things like uh, crime or pollutant levels, et cetera. But walkability will typically include consideration of a set of factors, you know, availability of sidewalks and, and suitable, um, suitable uh, quality of, of those uh, sidewalks, et cetera. Um, and uh, ability to you know, readily go from one area to the other. So one can associate, uh, and I'm not a GIS expert. Wade has actually done yet more than I, but I, I think one would incorporate it with shape files that would basically characterize for particular regions of the space walkability indices. Okay, so it would say for certain subregions of this, um, there be there be a certain walkability score. That, that's associated with it. And any logic allows you to read in, you can see there's the shape files sort of uh, component here. It allows you to, to read in shape file data, um, which, which provides that sort of extra level of, of, of information. So you can, can read in the shape files that so would provide this, you know, this type of extra, um, um, extra information to the map. And then you could query within the model um, for a, per, a given person's context, because a, a given person here, sorry, this is, is, is coming out in a, a convoluted way, but uh, this model is composed of persons. The persons have a certain decision-making behavior illustrated. That's right. So Michael, I wanted to have some discussion of this, try to pull that into this afternoon. Marisa, could you remind me to, um, you wouldn't mind, put, if you could put down in that list um, uh, action types. I want to talk about action types. So, so decision making is shown here with respect to food choices, but we could have decision making with respect to walkability um, um, and physical activity, sedentary behavior. So there might be a, a set of processes a person would undergo in terms of, um, their daily behavior and uh, the walkability score would either influence a decision-making process diagrammed out explicitly or at a more abstract level, um, as the walkability index goes up, you might characterize there as being a greater likelihood that someone uh, who had the motivation to do so and awareness of the need to do so, um, or otherwise the inclination to do so, would would be able to go out and and use the outdoor resources. Okay, so you'd you'd have to have some sort of link between walkability score and behavior. Okay, this gets into matters of you know health psychology and such. And, and I'm not an expert in that area, but I do believe that there have been a lot of studies relating. Um, Health behaviors and and you know walking and, and sedentary and, and moderate and vigorous physical activity behaviors on the one hand to walkability in this and so what one would have to draw in that literature and and try to capture a relationship in this model either more sort of um, uh, elemental relationship or a more articulated relationship to decision making between the two of them and you would then have an agent who being in uh, an environment of said walkability would be engaging in physical activity. And that would then affect their physical activity. For example, their, their energy expenditure via physical activity. Right now, this is depending on the park distance. Uh, in other words, uh, sorry, 
the distance from home to nearest park, which is based on their GIS position. So in the model, their home in this model is at a certain place. And we assess for this distance from home to nearest park, what said distance is. Um, I will uh, go and, and look this up. It's been years since I built this model, but um, you know, I will, um, I will see if I can, um, and can find where this is. Yes, here it is. Okay. Um, uh, and right. Um, uh, so distance there and uh, okay, it's just factored into that. Okay. I would have to find out exactly where this uh, is set in the model, but this distance from home to nearest park basically reflects right now some aspects of where their home is to the nearest park. Okay? And probably you would have a similar factor here, which is instead something to do with walkability. And it would affect moderate to vigorous physical activity or at least their propensity for non-sedentary behavior during the day. That would in turn induce a certain change to energy balance for the individual. This is one way it could be captured. Okay. Another way it could be captured is at a higher level, you draw on literature relating walkability to likelihood of weight gain or of becoming obese over some period of time. So it might be, rather than getting into the energy dynamics of it, you instead deal with um, weight categories and uh, you know the risk of developing obesity, your risk of, of going from normal weight to overweight or overweight to obese based on you know walkability of environments. And again, I'm not an expert in that literature, but I do suspect that there are exactly controlled studies that seek to test. Um, uh, well, I should be careful. It, it may not be a, a, it wouldn't be a controlled study, but it would probably be a study that seeks to tease out at least associational relationships between them in a multivariate context, which statistically try to control for the effects of of other confounders and, and try to assess the impacts of walkability. And you would draw on those relationships to try to, to try to capture how does it affect weight change and the likelihood of certain weight change. By so doing, you would then have an individual in the model whose status over time, whose likelihood of becoming overweight or likelihood of going from overweight to obese depends on the walkability, either through energy dynamics or, or more directly on weight. And, and that would capture their aspects of their context. And you could ask what if questions, if you could improve the walkability of their surrounding environments, if, if you know, investments were put in place to, to you know, enhance crumbling sidewalks or put sidewalks where they otherwise were absent or you know, enhance the ability to cross uh, from one area to another, so you don't have to go on big circuitous routes characteristic of, of, of certain suburban regions. You know, I suspect you could you could have a rather nice model. There, so I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. The, 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 sorry, the walkability scale, okay. Correct. Yeah, so, so these are great questions. And the, it, it, it's, it you know, merits or it motivates a reflection on what these models are. Remember, these models are trying to capture theory about what's, what's you know, plausibly going on out there in the world with a certain simplification of that theory. Um, and, you know, I think you want to ask, Okay, um, walkability is one part of the equation. It's one part, uh, it's one important element that shapes, you know, physical activity dynamics, energy balance, uh, weight change. Um, but it's not the only one. And I actually, 
alluded to this in sotto voce, um, you know, about 10 minutes ago when I said there's other elements like uh, motivation or awareness or, you know, uh, inclination to engage in physical activity. There's many factors which, um, you know, studies have helped explicate, right? I mean, there's issues of, um, of, of availability of time. There's issues having to do again with physical safety, um, and, and you know there's real there's real gender imbalances there because of the horrendously um, you know elevated risks that women are exposed to sometimes um, in adverse environments. There's also issues of of uh, social norms and patriarchy and so on, where in some cultures where women are not viewed as um, it's, if you're not viewed as proper for them to be outside walking. Um, there are issues having to do with childcare and you know, difficulty accessing uh, you know, the chance for, for a mother to go walk at a time where the life where it might be very important um, to do so for her health um, when she has several small children. Right? Um, so there's many factors that um, those looking at uh, the um, and in the physical activity literature have documented beyond walkability. And really what they are laying out there in prose, in text, and in statistical form are elements of a theory of what, you know, what shapes healthy, healthy living, right? Um, and what I'm saying is that models uh, serve as an avenue to take said theory or elements of that theory, put them into an operational form to, to make them specific in a way that's consistent with the knowledge base and understanding of health psychology and psychosocial, biopsychosocial factors and, and health, et cetera. Put them into a form that can then, you can say, well, what are the consequences of this for weight change in this neighborhood over time? And how would it be different if we affected, you know, if we were to invest in enhancing walkability, or if we were to, to you know, to elevate um, kids' exposure to, you know, physical activity, healthy physical activity um, uh, environments, or if we were to inculcate um, uh, programs for youth and young adults um, to allow for greater recreation, you put in place more ball courts or put in place more um, safe walking groups, right? Um, um, you know, other factors come in here are social support matters, right? Um, and agent-based models provide actually a really valuable tool for looking at this. Um, and, you know, they could like to say, ask what if questions, and if we could get in place a social support group for, um, uh, you know, for, for those seeking to engage in physical activity so they would feel physically secure out walking and, and it would uh, provide them with, um, you know, a, a, a social, social support for their commitment to physical activity as well as um, you know, companionship and, uh, and potentially could be involved with, you know, you could have, uh, child support associate with that. You could ask what if questions in a model that would let you explicate that out. Now, that it's not that the model is being used instead of the theory in the literature. The model is embodying what theory is known or, or elements of what some researchers have found in the literature and filling in some gaps with plausible characterization. And then you say, what if you need run it? I, is, is that helpful? Yeah, so so I'm going to, so this is a good dialogue, and I, I want to, um, to refer back to a couple of things that I mentioned in some earlier reflections in, in the boot camp. Um, and in comments actually 
that I made also on the first day, um, and, and actually in the second day, model conceptualization. So in the model conceptualization side, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if I have a, you know, an easy slide to, to call this up right now, it's a way to call this up. Um, on the model conceptualization side, I had, um, uh, I had a depiction of sort of models in a continuum. Um, and, you know, I'll, at, the, at the cost of um, not having this be quite as easily accessible for our remote attendees, I will, uh, I will turn uh, places on the board over here. Um, so, um, uh, there we are. Um, so, so it had a spectrum of models, right? And, and we had sort of highly stylized models here. Um, uh, these are models for theory building. Um, and then we had sort of uh, very, uh, in, in, you know, richly uh, empirically uh, grounded, okay? um, grounded models. Um, and, and what I said here was that models differ a great deal on, on where they are in the spectrum. And the, what you look for in a model is different. If you look for, in the topic you're talking about, I would refer you specifically to the work of Anna D.A. Rue um, and her collaborators. Anna, for those who don't know, the Dean of School of Public Health in, in um, Emory or, or um, uh, Drexel, thank you. I'm um, sorry, I, I, they go to the same equivalent class in my mind. Drexel, yeah. Um, uh, sort of mid-Atlantic, uh, mid-Atlantic strong university with, with strong, uh, health science. Um, yeah, um, she used to be um, head of, department head of epidemiology at, at Michigan. Um, and she's a, an excellent agent-based model. And she tends to build models which um, are quite stylized, but have the ring of plausibility to it, okay? Now, those are going to have a characterization of walkability that is not as empirically detailed. It's not gonna deal with all these other forms, of, you know, patriarchy and social support, et cetera, which, which are there in the literature. You know, and, and which have have been examined very significantly, um, and and you know she derives from this some high level insights from models that are very different from what you look for from a model from over here. As you go here to the right, you're taking into account more factors, okay, and you're you're trying to tie them in with with empirical data on these factors. In, in, a, in a greater variety of sort of causal paths. Her models tend to be rather more stylized, uh, but very thoughtful about the impacts of walkability and, and, um, and uh, neighborhood design and, and I think uh, social influences, et cetera. Thoughtful, um, not always empirically grounded, rather they are, um, they are plausible. Um, Given what we know, they're plausible. There's nothing that they fall, they don't fly in the face of anything in the literature and they have reasonable parameter values, but they're not actually eliciting from the literature detailed estimates for how much is walkability impacted versus you know, awareness of, of you know, health benefits versus time availability versus you know, the crime index, it's, it's, it's not empirically grounded at that level of sort of, you know, having uh, a tremendous amount of data to sort of say exactly how much does walkability make a difference from the literature and, and aligning the model exactly with that. It's, it's much more high level, simple model, simple effects in relationships and, and quite easy to build these models. I mean, these models, for our group, we could we could pump those out very, very readily uh, in terms of the mechanics. The hard thing is figuring out a model that's elegant and 
plausible and in line with the literature. It's not in tension with any of the literature, and it has the ring of plausibility and, and, and you know, um, um, significance to it. By contrast, you know, we can also have a model of this same phenomenon, which does try to capture in a quantitative way many, many different factors on this in a, in a quite fine grained level. And that would be a much bigger undertaking, you know, where, where you'd be get the role of social support versus walkability versus, you know, um, uh, crime prevention efforts versus, uh, you know, um, efforts to, to, to run, you know, to, to, to have awareness of, um, uh, of, of physical activity options or what have you. And, and that would be a much bigger undertaking. So I'm not suggesting you have to do this. I would actually suggest honest types of models where, where you're, you have the, the ring of plausibility and you look at that are much, uh, are, are, have a great deal to recommend. I think actually there's, you know, if, if someone were to start out on a model on this, wanting to incorporate walkability, I'd say, look there first. Now, on this model, she's, she's gonna tell you that like, you shouldn't use this model to say, we're going to, you know, as a result of this model, we will save $52 million for the next many years in, you know, hip replacements because people's healthier weight. Like, it's, it's not, that's not a model that's going to be able to give those precise estimates for outcomes or allow you, Yumaya, in, in predicting exactly people diabetes change over the next 20 years. It's, it's much more, you know, kind of high level ahas or insights. Wow, if we could only invest in walkability and social support together, we can do much better than each of them in isolation. That's a sort of high level insight, you might say. We need to do them together, not like we're going to get exactly a 9% reduction in diabetes in three years out and 11% in 12 years out, et cetera. Like she would say, no, 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 it's, it's, it doesn't have enough empirical um, uh, sort of empirical richness to capture all of that. It's more high level insight from the model that. Yeah, we need to do these things together, and we can see an effect, you know, within ten years, roughly. Um, but it's it's not precise enough to allow a close prediction of exactly how certain chronic diseases would be affected over time. If you want that, you're talking getting to a right hand side of the spectrum because you're going to need more empirical data to sort of um, make sense of those patterns. You're talking about adding. I don't know if that's that. Yeah. Anna Dieru, um, uh, uh, ANA. And I'm going to, to, to spell this probably wrong, but a um, uh, close colleague of mine, wonderfully inspiring leader, ANA uh, D I E Z um, uh, R O U X um, with a hyphen for me. Oh, richly empirically grounded. So, so these are ones that like have extensive empirical data pinning down their assumptions. Okay. By the way, I would note like system dynamics models fall in the same spectrum. This is not specific to system dynamics models. You never see with discrete event simulation. Well, okay, maybe a little bit, but most most discrete event simulation practitioners just don't go through because we are, we're coming out of inductive. But system dynamics is this. The same difference, and you know, John Sturman's models are located differently aligned with, and you know, Barry Richmond's models were back in the day, or I don't know. If that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, that was fun. Go blue. Yes, yes, for Michigan. Yes. Um. So where was the question? Sorry, question. Wade had a question. Oh, you speak on youth. Um, so, so your knowledge, uh, my knowledge works. Yeah. Yeah. 
Really? Okay, so, so what you're saying is that the AnyLogic platform allows you to read them in as imagery, something like that? So you can't say like, what is, like the shape file can't have this area, has this level of pollutants, um, you know, with respect to PPM file. They do, I know. But I mean, any logic. Uh, okay, so so you could read it in separately through code, but uh, then you're doing it yourself. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. It's just like. If you want the model logic to depend on the contents of that said shape file, like the the walkability index for this zone that this person is in, you would what you're saying is you would you might read the shape file in to show pictures of it and you know on the map and so on, um, different levels of walkability, but but you're in order to have the agent say, what's my walkability right now? You know, what's the walkability in my area right now? You would need a separate data structure basically read in from said file that you would have to, you know, a, a, a Wade-like individual would read, <laughs> would read in. Basically, there'd be, there'd be some custom code to read that in and say, this area has walkability X. And basically, you would look up the person's position in that. They are subject to this one. Yeah. Okay, so that's good to understand. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, so sorry. Um, I was distracted by camera minutiae. So, wait. Uh, Bjorn just made an utterance of considerable significance. So, I'd I'd ask you to repeat that. So, what you said is ArcGIS has the ability to incorporate walkability measures quite re or manipulate re walkability measures quite re quite readily. And you said something about exporting that. In a way that could be used then by agents. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, sorry. Well, well, okay, we need to distinguish between two things, though. What I, 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 what I heard Yom said is he assumes if you could do it in Python, you could do it in any logic. Not, you can't do it through any logic. You have to do it in Java in any logic, which we accept, which I think, yeah. 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 You would do it through Java. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You wouldn't do it via any, like, it's not that any logic provides the mechanism to do that. No, it's it's you would have to write code. Yeah. Interrogate. 
Yeah, I think this is the same issue we have been talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a good point. So, so uh, sorry. You, the folks online may not have heard the discussion. The, the basic gist here is that, um, and Wade, correct me if I'm off base in any of my characterization. Basic gist is any logic shape files, as any shape file, um, can incorporate um, types of data that are um, that are you know different than 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 um, uh, you know routinized map data. For example, they could have walkability indices or pollution indices or or any any other environmental characteristics. Um, those shape files can be read in by any logic in a way that allows them to be layered visually atop the maps. But the support built into any logic stops there. It, what you cannot do, which is you know, interesting um, for my learning, is that you can't say within any logic, you know, uh, basically using that data, is this agent location in an, you know, tell me the walkability for this, that where this agent is located. You cannot, even though it's in the shape file that any logic is used, it, it is not able to answer that question using that database of information. Now the database is in, of information is there in the shape file. So, so just as Yom manipulates these shape files with Python um, to, to analyze them, and just as you can do the analysis with shape files in R by writing R code, or you could um, uh, you could read those shape files into any logic using Java libraries that you could probably call that are ArcGIS libraries or whatever. Java does have ArcGIS, but you would you any it, it's not any logics. You're not using any logic features. You'd either have to write your own code or basically use libraries that manipulate shape files provided by shape. And, and you would use those libraries as you would use Python libraries or use R libraries in other contexts to sort of perform the analysis. It just wouldn't be in any, it'll be, you're in an any logic model, but you're not using any logic mechanisms to do those parts. So hopefully that's that's uh, that's helpful. Yeah, Wade said write a bunch of custom code, and I mean, or use you know Java libraries to do that. And, and that's the question: is what, what's the nature of Java Java GIS libraries? I think there actually are quite extensive, but uh, we can get into that at some point by appropriate. Yeah. Okay. So um. You know, time is moving on, and we have a lot to cover this morning. So I hope that discussion is helpful. It kind of crossed over a lot of different areas, and I appreciate Maya's um, questions and, and questions from uh, Michael and Guillaume and anyone else who spoke up. So let's take a break for ten minutes here. So uh, we'll reconvene, um, let's say at ten twenty um, Saskatchewan time, and we will jump into the discussion of data and models. Appropriately enough. Thanks very much. Maybe maybe we'll comment a little bit if, if we can find out a bit on the Java uh, shape file uh, situation. Thanks. Oh yeah, yeah. Any logic can interrogate SQL databases. Yeah. No, this is absolutely the case. Um, uh, and any logic has the built-in ability to query. S SQL. Uh, I don't know the degree to which um, these databases of information are in SQL. No. That structure query language, the database uh, uh, query and manipulation. Thanks.